Have your attention, please. Welcome, fellow Toastmasters, honored guests, and dignitaries. Welcome to the Southwest Division Humorous Speech and Evaluation Contest. My name is Chris Costakis. I am the Southwest Division Governor. Some of you have traveled for over an hour to get here. Some of you would have preferred watching the Bears game. <laughs> you know, there will be no blocking and tackling here. <laughs> but you will find it entertaining, and thank you for coming. <coughs> Please turn off your pagers or phones. I guess there are no pagers with your phones. <laughs> you have it already? All right, I want to introduce to you the person who has organized this contest, the chair of the contest, Mr. Jim Green. Our guests, thank you very much for coming out on this Sunday afternoon in the autumn. We all got a brief taste of winter yesterday. I don't know about you, but we saw some snow flurries near our house down near Orland. Heard, uh, one of my good friends lives up in Abbotsford, Wisconsin, got an inch of snow, so we didn't get quite that much. But again, the fall season is upon us, and we appreciate very much you coming out on this beautiful afternoon. It should be a very exciting contest. We've got really good contestants. Uh, I said several of the area contests. The speakers, the evaluators are very good, so it will be a very entertaining, as Chris has said, it will be a very entertaining afternoon. What I would like to do briefly right now is just bring the dignitaries up here, the district officers that are here and officials, just to recognize how much work they're doing and how much they have done. I'm working for the list here, so forgive me if I double check or Check off on someone. Donna Weston is here. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a new part. Secret. But tonight, and here in the Southwest Division, we are calling it the 2014 Humorous Speech and Speech Evaluation Contest. My name is Iqbal Acha, and I will be your 
Toastmaster for the afternoon. And before I go any farther, I'd like for each and every single one of you to turn to your neighbor, smile. You can wink if you want to. <laughs> but I want you to show them your most prized possession. <laughs> Now, I'm not talking about the keys to the Lexus. I'm not talking about the diamond ring. I'm certainly not talking about anything that you would find imprudent on a screen. Now, what I am asking all of you to do is show them your iPhone, Galaxy, Droid, whatever it is. Beeps, birds, birds, chirps, wheezes, rings, and that's what these things. We all know that these things have a tendency of distracting the audience, so please. Out of respect for both the contestants and the audience members, keep looking at your name. Smile. Show them the off button. Now. <laughs> okay. Now, the contest chair has been kind enough to introduce all of the dignitaries, and with that, we will now begin. So we have two contests today. We have a humorous speech contest and we have a speech evaluation contest. The first contest will be the speech evaluation contest. And when that contest has concluded, we will have a 10 minute break. And when we resume, that is when we will commence with the humorous speech contest. Now as everybody knows, there's always a disclaimer for everything. We live in a very litigious society. So here is the disclaimer for the contest. Contestants, timers, ballot counters, sergeant at arms, everybody, and I mean everybody, has been briefed prior to the beginning of this contest. Everyone is aware of the Toastmaster International rules that govern this contest. No one should leave or enter the area during any of the contestants' profiles. If you do, the Sergeant at Arms may pummel you. If he does, it's not Toastmasters International's liability. You may do so, if time permits, during the minute of silence between presentations. And I thank you for respecting me. With that said, let the contest begin. announcing the speaking order for the speech evaluation contest. Contestant number one, Keisha Thomas. Contestant number one, Keisha Thomas. Contestant number two, Dan Seidler. Contestant number two, Dan Seidler. Contestant number three, Garrett Gray. Contestant number three, Garrett Gray. Contestant number four, Paul Butkovich. Contestant number four, Paul Butkovich. I believe on your agenda there will be a fifth name that has been pre-printed. That individual will not be competing this evening. Since this is a speech evaluation contest, these contestants need somebody to evaluate. We have the perfect woman for the job. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the stage Melanie Holmes, the female assumption. The female assumption, Melanie Holmes. Cheryl always wanted to be a teacher. 
when she got her first classroom, it was a wonderful moment. Cheryl's passion is underprivileged kids. She believes they need great teachers. But there is something about Cheryl that makes people raise their eyebrows. You see, she does not want her own kids. Another woman I interviewed who also happens to be a teacher has heard, if you don't want your own kids, why did you become a teacher? Women receive these kind of reactions, whether they are childless by choice or by circumstance. Assumptions. Assumptions are based on our beliefs and our emotions. Assumptions can be innocent and the consequences unintentional. We don't mean for anyone to think that, they, that we think their lives are less meaningful because they don't have kids. And yet we will hear people say, my life was meaningless until I had kids. And that statement can come, of course comes from a place of love. But if you say that, take a look around and see who is listening. Voiced assumptions are everywhere. And we don't think twice sometimes when we say that. <coughs> little girl might hear, you're so good with your little cousin, I just know you're going to be paying a great, great mommy. But what if that little girl grows up and doesn't want to be a mom? What if she wants something else? Or what if she doesn't find the right circumstance or the right partner? Or what if she's biologically unable to have a child? And you might say to yourself, well then, she'll find a way to fill that void. But why would we want a woman to feel that there's a void to begin with? I have interviewed or polled 200 women for my book. I have heard voices of confusion, pain, sometimes anger, and depression. Depression, ah, that unwelcome visitor. I believe in an ounce of prevention rather than a pound of cure. I believe that we can talk about women's lives that broaden the idea of what a fulfilled female life looks like. <coughs> I once read a Facebook posting that said, I never knew love until I became a mom. And that's a very sweet sentiment. But I would hope that our love for most of us began with our parents and our siblings if we have them. And for anyone who has had a pet, you can attest to that bond, that love that is true. Years ago, my husband and I lost a pet to illness, and it was the first time I saw my husband sob. Sob. My husband is six foot three and a rock with a military background. And the other time I've seen him sob is when his mom died, two times in two decades. While I'm on the topic of my husband, my love for him is profound. Yes, I do know love besides the love that I feel for my children. There are many aspects of love that are amazing. Now, my friend who posted that on Facebook did not mean for one of her childless friends to say, hey, wait a minute, does this mean, does she think I don't know love just because I don't have a child? But this can happen. I heard a comment that all that Oprah Winfrey has accomplished is for nothing because she has no child to leave her legacy to. Oprah has helped establish 60 schools in 13 countries. Oprah's legacy is every life she has touched. Family is a core value of America, but is it the same for everyone? There are families of two heterosexual or same sex. There are families of choice, people who have walked away from toxic families and their friends feel more like family. One woman said to me, my family and friends used to bug me all the time about having kids. So I disassociated with family and got new friends. Is this what we want? Would we like for family or friends to walk away from us because we assume to know what's best for them? Now, society has been making assumptions about women's lives since the beginning of time. And women's voices have been stifled. And this is not new news. Women did not get a voice in politics until 1920. And black women were brought to this country as property. And it took 100 years 
after they were free for their voices to even begin to be heard. And by the way, the woman considered the mother of the civil rights movement, Rosa Parks, was childless. She devoted the rest of her life to activism. I am not here to advocate for or against motherhood. I am here to advocate for the view that women are whole beings no matter their path. I call on each one of us to examine our assumptions and to respect each woman's journey. Really respect her because she is your sister, your niece, your daughter, your coworker, or your best friend. And she deserves to feel whole. Mr. We will now give our speech evaluation contestants five minutes to complete their evaluations. Sergeant at Arms. Please escort the contestants out of the room. The timers, when I know, when I signal you, please leave me five minutes on the clock. excuse evaluation contestants those five minutes, but while they're doing their job, I think it would be a remiss on our part if we didn't get a chance to learn a little bit more about our target speaker. So please help me welcome back to the stage Ms. Melanie Holmes.
diversity of people and animals. I worked for Brookfield Zoo for 11 years, and I helped found their diversity committee team, and we um, did a lot of great things there. We brought a lot of teamwork among staff, work to diversify our guests. Can I keep saying our? Because I only stopped working there a few months ago. <laughs> so I, I like to, whenever I refer to them, I say, we have policies and mm -hmm. we are great. The zoo has a lot of policies to, to diversify their guests, their membership, their, their employee pool. So I guess you'd say diversity of people and animals. Now, Linda, you mentioned on stage something about a book that you've written. Tell us a little bit about the book. Is it called The Female Assumption? It is, and it was published a few days ago. Oh! I did my speech on this speech, which is why Barbara stepped out as an evaluator. She didn't know that I was going to do that speech on Wednesday night, and it was the day the book published. It actually a little sooner than I was expecting, but I knew I wanted to do my speech, so I was there on the day it was published. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can tell you in the audience today, I already know that there are several authors and authors in the making. Um, give us an idea of what it's like now. Now that your book is published, what's the next step? Are you marketing it? Are you doing this world tour? Will we see you in Malaysia? What's the story? Well, I'm trying to figure that out. I'm thankful for the internet. There's a lot of tools there to help. Because you really, as an author, and I think I looked up your profile and you're an author, so you know that you, you have to do a lot of self-promotion. Even when you have a book discussion, I attended a book discussion last Sunday at the Beverly Arts Center. I was the only person there. Now that person's book released a year ago, but I would hope that it, that author would have done a little more at self-promoting, at getting some of her people to show up, people that maybe hadn't had a chance to hear her talk. So I have a book discussion, which only has three slots left, uh -huh. which is a great problem to have. Uh, but my capacity is 60, so I plan to have 60 people. Wow. So I don't know how many people are here, but this group is a little intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks. This was a good opportunity. Very good. Um, you have a quote here, and I don't know if it's something that you. Oh, I scribbled it really fast. I don't know. Well, I'm going to read it. So it says, "Prejudice grows like weeds in a heart unfertilized by education." I like that. I'm going to repeat that. Charlotte Prejudice. Brunson. Thank you, Charlotte Brunson. I was going to ask who, who said it, and obviously it has inspired you in many, many ways. Um, do you remind yourself of this quote on a daily, weekly basis, or do you just... Absolutely. Uh, education is key to everything. Everything that we think, everything that we do, everything that we say, we can, we can assume to know what our kids want. If, if you have kids, and I have three, and my oldest is 30, you can assume to know what your child's life will look like when they're grown, but you cannot know. So my oldest has spoken of an ambivalence toward parenthood. Do I make him feel guilty? Why would I do that? That would push him away. That would make him feel bad. That's not my job. My job is to love and support the people that are closest to me. And I never assume to know whether you're a good person or not, all I seek to know is to understand. You can seek to understand. And that's where education is. <coughs> now, Lenny, again, thank you so much for being on Target Speaker. Everyone, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. before the first contestant and between each contestant. Timekeepers, when I advise you to, please begin the timer for one minute and signal me when it be one.
evaluation contestant number one, Keisha Thomas. Keisha Thomas, speech evaluation contestant number one.
speech evaluation contestant number two. Dan Siler. Dan Siler, speech evaluation contestant number two. filled with so much passion and emotion, it really sets the stage for something wonderful, almost something sp spiritual. And what I really admired about your presentation was that the, you're talking about the, the whole being, no matter what the path you choose, it's all about the journey. And your, your t t t t title, the, the Female Assumption, actually f f f f f female, uh, is, is going to have kids, and, and and you really talk about why that's your that's your choice, and for for whatever reason, if you choose to have kids, if you don't choose to have have, have kids, there's so much more in this wonderful life and that we live that that there's so much more that, that you can really enjoy your life and, and share it with other people. I have a couple things I want to talk about that will, will help you reach to the next uh, plateau of your speaking. One of the things is always check with the Toastmaster about the speaking area because it looked like you were really concerned and really confused. Oh, I got to speak from up here? And as you walked up here and you started t talking, you realized you had your notes in your hand. And throughout the whole speech, I, I, you were kind of moving your notes know, back and forth. I had no place to put them down and things. Also, I was, I was sitting really close. I was in the second row. And it was really hard to hear you, even being so close. I really like your outfit and your dress professional. So you really stood, you really stood out up here. And one of the things you did, you were pretty, it's a really intense speech, really a really passionate speech. And the only time you really used your, bo your body, we were talking about your friends. And you shifted and you went like this. So, and then, and then as soon as you were done, as soon as you told that story about your friends, you came back to center. So, I was, so you might want to use the stage a little bit more. I really didn't feel like you had eye contact throughout the whole audience. I, I thought you were really focused on that one person right down the middle. That's always good to have better eye contact with the crowd, look around the room. Pick someone that you like, look at them, <laughs> complete your thought, and then move on to the next. And then to move on to the next thought. But I thought your speech were really well written and delivered to show us the passionate way. Mr. Toastmaster. Speech evaluation contestant number four, Paul Butkovich. Paul Butkovich, speech evaluation contestant number four. Toastmasters and our guests. I found um, that uh, your speech, Melanie, was something that, that really fit with what, I, of what I've been hearing uh, about, uh, about that sort of an issue before. It's a perspective that's not often seen. And I, I, I also can imagine just what kind of bravery it took to come up and to talk about it, given the way that society currently goes. 
But being as it's a perspective that's not often seen, I felt that it took us, it, you, you, it took us a while to, to sort of move into that. And I think that part of that was because of the way that you used a lot of varying examples when you were giving that, when you were attempting to draw us in. I feel perhaps that using more, a few of the smaller examples and putting more of a, of a broader focus, getting us more invested in the individual people might have been a, a better way to go about it. And I have to admit, you have a very, very uh, methodical way of going uh, through all of it as you were standing there. You were, you, were, you were absolutely confident and you knew exactly what you were going to say, which I really, really liked. I also liked how you were doing your, uh, your eye contact as you looked at each member of the audience and you didn't shirk away from them no matter what you were saying. I did notice though that you had a tendency to sort of lean back and forth as you were standing in one place and put one hand behind your back as you were holding your, what I assume were notes of some variety. I also missed you didn't really take out those notes very often, and I, I, I look at them. So I assume you're working on <coughs> the point where you don't need them anymore. So I feel that eventually you'll be able to get the left hand out, and you'll be able to start making the gestures. With your left hand. <laughs> I also noticed that you tended to have a bit of a issue with keeping your uh, elbows in tight, which is normal, that's how most people normally talk. But I've also found that the more expansive gestures that really bring the audience in require more than, uh, a more of a, an inclusive movement. I also felt you could stand to project more. You have a, very, uh, a good voice, but even sitting where I was halfway down the crowd, there were some times when I found that you were slightly hard to hear. So you, if you could project out more so that even the people sitting in the very back <coughs> would be able to hear you. <coughs> I also felt you could have stood a little bit more in motion and, and vocal variety as you were speaking. You had, a, you had uh, points when you were definitely trying to make us more outraged, you were trying to, uh, to make us you know, feel, and you succeeded in my part, but I felt you might have been more effective if you had really gone for outrage or if you would really gone for being sad, as opposed to being a little bit too solid, a, bit, a little bit too controlled. Now that control obviously is what allowed you to go on with very few in the way of ums and just move through with such confidence, but it can be a little restricting. All in all, I'd say you have a solid foundation, but all you need to do is add the little details that will make it that much better. Thank you very much.
Mr. Ponzi Master, we have all the bells.